والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Inspirations All praises due to Allah We praise Him We seek His aid and we ask for His forgiveness we send peace and blessings on our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations in which we will keep talking about the life of the best man to live on this earth, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are trying to learn from his wisdom. We're trying to learn from his intelligence. We're trying to learn from his wonderful character with the hopes that we will be able to follow his example. So this is a goal or oh, this is one of the most important goals in the life of every Muslim, to follow the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa just to follow the verse which Allah, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed in Muhammad there has been for you the best role model, the best example for each one of you to follow. So this is something very important for every Muslim to, to, to learn and to know. And from the wisdom of something that really reveals the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fact that when we look at the state of the Muslims today, the challenges they face, the hardships they have to deal with, you know, the trials they, un they undergo, all of those, the answers to them are in the Qur'an and in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for the people who study the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam carefully, and they, you know, manage to reveal much of the secrets, much of the wisdoms that we find there. For them, they know what's the best way to deal with the situation in which we live today. They know exactly the solution to everything. And they know that any solution takes time. It has to take its full course. But unfortunately, most of the people, the average Muslim, because of lack of knowledge, because of lack of Islamic awareness, they are always hasty. They can only plan one step or two steps ahead as in maximum. But the reality is that we need a strategy. We need to set our goals and make them clear. And once we make that, you know, we will move from one step to the other. But if you ask the average Muslim generally, especially those who busy themselves and spend most of their lives, most of their time, you know, watching uh, the news channels and get frustrated every day more frustrated on the situation of the Muslims and when any small hope, even if it's unreal, that there will be some kind of victory or some kind of triumph to anything that is attached to Islam, even if it is falsely attached to Islam, you see them having high hopes and you see if they think that, you know, Islam will come and assume its high position that Allah has made for it. Without them being aware of the natural law that before Islam reaches its level, we have to go through different stages. So lack of this understanding really brings us a lot of ups and downs, psychological ups and downs. But for the people who have wisdom, the people who always attach themselves to the Qur'an, trying to learn from its wisdom, and the people who study the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, those who study the seerah of the Messenger, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, they know exactly where we are today. And they are not eluded or deluded or deceived by some of the things that people, you know, hang high hopes on. No. So this is why it's, it's been very important for us to learn this era of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because once we really understand it uh, fairly, we will be able to judge our case today, our situation today, and we will be able to know where we stand. We will be able to tell where we went wrong, what are the things we need to address, what are the problems that we need to find solution to. So this is why it's very important for us to busy ourselves, study the life of Muhammad wasallam, study the Qur'an, study the Sunnah. You know, we hear so many people, I personally hear so many people, some of them are very close to me. They say, you know, the Muslims are being killed, the Muslims are being massacred everywhere around the world, you know, you, know, you name it, Palestine, uh, we have Chechnya, Kashmir, we have Somalia, we have Iraq. We have different parts of the world. So many Muslims are being killed and you, be, you talk about knowledge and you're talking about studying the Qur'an and the Sunnah. They said this is not an attitude of a Muslim. You know, this kind of understanding comes with lack of knowledge of Islam. 
Well, we mentioned the example where the Prophet وسلم, you know, had his companions being tortured by the enemies of Islam. They were massacred, they were humiliated. They received the worst type of torture, one of the worst examples in history of torture. The companions of the Prophet وسلم, were, the, were the subject to that. But when Khabbad came to the Prophet وسلم, he didn't say to him, okay, ask for victory, let Allah give us victory, let's go and fight against them. No, he said, all, all what he asked the Prophet وسلم, for, he said, please just make dua for us. Make dua that Allah alleviates this pain, he takes it, takes it away. Just call on Allah to lift this state away from us. So the Prophet وسلم, said to him, oh people, you are hasty. You are hasty, the Prophet وسلم, didn't do anything. So was the Messenger ﷺ uh, lacking in terms of understanding? Was he some kind, a'udhu billah of this word, but was he some kind of coward that he couldn't defend his companions? He couldn't defend his companions. So we have to understand our reality. We can't live in some kind of imaginary world. You know, we know Islam today is not in the position that it, uh, that it, were, uh, that, that it were occupying during the past, the high position. We lack military power. We lack knowledge of Islam, first of all. We lack Iman. You know, if you just study or make some kind of a uh, study among the average Muslims, what kind of Iman do they have? What kind of knowledge do they have? What kind of tawakkul and belief in Allah do they have? And how far is it you know, reflected on their actions? We know that the results will not be impressive. So how can we hope that Allah gives us victory and Allah makes us the uppermost in this world without us fulfilling the condition that Allah has made for that? So studying the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, as we said right at the beginning of this series, that it helps us understand how things work in this world. So we start to plan according to, according to an intelligent strategy. Most people, when they think about the victory of Islam, they always think, as I said, one or two steps ahead, that's it. And then they want to achieve victory. No. For each phase, we have temporary uh, goals or objectives. We have to achieve them. And from, them, from there, we move to another phase. And the other phase has, has its own goals and objectives. Yes, there is a main goal, which is to make the word of Allah the uppermost and the highest in this world. But each stage has its sub-goals or secondary goals. So we have to understand that. And the Prophet ﷺ realized that at, during the Meccan period, the, upper, or the most important goal of that phase was not to have military power, but to establish Iman in the hearts. To build individuals, cultivate individuals, based on the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people who, are, who were ready to put their lives for the sake of Islam, for the sake of make, making the word of Allah the highest. This is why the Messenger wasallam was successful. This is why we have to learn from his seerah, learn from his life, learn from his conduct, learn from his planning. So we start to do that ourselves today. And this is what we lack, this is what we need, and this is the only way to achieve victory and to get Islam to its high position that it really deserves to be in. So this is why we study the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is why we invite our brothers and sisters who are very, you know, they have a strong passion, an overwhelming passion for Islam. They want it to be the highest, but passion enough and emotions they are not enough, and they are not the requirement for Islam to be the highest. We have to understand the laws that govern this world, which we call them as Sunan al kawniyyah They govern this world. If we don't understand them, we will be wasting our time. We'll, we will be like you know, a bird being put in a room where there is a window. One side of the window is blocked with glass, and the other side of the window is open. So the bird doesn't see the glass, so it tries to go out of the window, it hits the glass so many times until it hurts itself. Yes, it is sincere, it wants to get out of the room, it wants to get outside. But it keeps hitting the glass head on until it hurts itself. But if it were to, to use intelligence and calculate things right, it would see and check the other side which was open and it could go easily with far less power and energy than it had wasted you know 
you know, colliding head on with the glass. This is our example today. And this is something we have to understand. This is something we have to study. If we don't do that, the only thing we will be doing is wasting our time, wasting our efforts, wasting the energy, wasting the resources Allah has given us. This is why knowledge is very important. It comes as the first priority today. Because the reason behind the Muslims being so much divided is lack of knowledge. Because if they had knowledge, they would know what their priorities are. They would know what is right and what is wrong. So when someone is on the wrong, we would give, the, give him advice. If he doesn't respond, then it's up to you. You have taken yourself out of the jama'ah, out of the congregation of the Muslims. Then the Muslims can be united. I hope we will be able to understand that because this was exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. He cultivated and he taught and educated his companions during the Meccan period. That was his main focus. And I hope that we will understand that this is what we need to do at this phase and at this stage. Now, last week we talked about, or last time we talked about the Prophet ﷺ when he planned for Hijrah. And we said in the Hijrah there are so many lessons. Uh, just before we get into the lessons, let me say that you see that the disbelievers or the uh, people of Quraysh, they did not save any effort, any idea, any means to destroy the da'wah of Muhammad wasallam. They tried everything. They tried to expel him out of the land. They tried to uh, kill him. They tried to put him in jail. They tried to you know, compromise. They tried to make him compromise and settle for something less. They try to, you know, tempt him and offer him some, some of the temptations of this world. They try to, they try to put some pressure on him via his uncle and his relatives and uh, through the boycott. But none of those means worked because the Prophet ﷺ had a mission and he was persistent and he was determined to fulfill it. Now... For them, they came to the conclusion that there is no other option but to kill Muhammad and get rid of him forever. Otherwise, he will be, bring much trouble to us. And as his companions have started to escape to Medina, then he's planning to establish something there and this will be a great threat for us. So let's get rid of him. Let's, you know, outroot the whole problem. So this is why they decided to kill the Prophet ﷺ. But the Messenger ﷺ had already planned to go outside Mecca and to travel or to make Hijrah to Medina. So this is why he had a plan with Abu Bakr that he would come to him and they would go. Or Abu Bakr would come to his house and they would go. So when Abu Bakr came to the house of the Prophet ﷺ, he found Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, being shrouded in the cloak of the Prophet ﷺ, the green cloak, and you know, lying on his bed. So Ali ibn Abi Talib said to him, the Messenger وسلم, made a change, okay, or some alteration, some modification to the plan. So go and meet with him uh, around the well of Maymun. So go and find him there. And now we will see, and this will reveal this story will reveal to us much of the intelligence of the Prophet وسلم, and uh, which is based on the divine guidance, obviously. But the lesson that we can take from that is, no matter you know any, no matter what we do, we have to plan it well. We have to do our best. Yes, we put our trust in Allah. Because the Messenger وسلم, was the best person. And he reached the highest level in terms of tawakkul and putting his trust in Allah. Despite all of that, he planned perfectly. And this is what we should do today. So when we plan for something, you know, be it a family, be it a business, be it a project, be it a charity, Anything we do, be it a study, anything we do, we have to plan it well. And then put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we don't do this, and if we happen to fail, we have only ourselves to blame. And unfortunately, looking at most of the projects, the majority of the projects that are described as Islamic projects, in the field of da'wah, in the field of media, in the field of education, in the field of even business sometimes, unfortunately, we lack this problem. Or we have this problem. We lack the proper planning for our projects. And this is why so many projects start and begin very powerful and strong. Then they start to deteriorate and go down until you know, they become a complete and total failure. Why? This is a very important question. We have to check ourselves. 
And we have to see, are we really working according to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? As I said, emotion and passion are not enough. Yes, they give us the energy, but we need the direction. We need the sense of direction and orientation. How can we get that? We get that by knowledge. We get that by studying the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, by understanding the general guidelines of Islam, by studying the Qur'an and studying the sunnah. Without that, we will be lost. This is how things work in this world. Without doing that, the projects will not succeed. Islamic projects will keep failing more and more and be the worst examples. Something else about Islamic projects. Most Islamic projects tend to depend or sometimes force their employees to do some of their work as in a, on a voluntary basis. This is why most of those projects don't succeed. Because Allah will not cause any government or any establishment to succeed if it's not based on justice. Most of the Islamic establishments and da'wah projects, most of them, you know, pay their employees very little. This is lack of justice, by the way. And this is what causes most of them to break down at the end. But we see most of the non-Muslim or like the the other projects that have uh, ulterior motives, that have you know, goals that aim at destroying the belief of this ummah, the, the way of life of this ummah, you know, they make sure that they pay the best wages to their employees to win their loyalty. And this is what we lack. So this is something we have to understand. And we find in the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ that he always encourages us to be just to the others, to appreciate the efforts of the others, to have nasiha to the others, always be willing, you know, to give them the best, especially the people who are working in the field of dawah. So the Prophet ﷺ, this is part of the planning. So the Messenger ﷺ planned very well. Abu Bakr went to his to the house of the Prophet ﷺ to find Ali. Ali said to him, "Go to the well of uh, Maymun. You will find the Prophet ﷺ there." He made some modification in the plan. Now, what happened with the disbelievers who gathered? Some narrations say eight. Some narrations say ten. Young strong young men in order to kill the Prophet ﷺ at once with one hit. What happened to them and how did they deal with the intelligence of the Prophet ﷺ? Inshallah we will find out after this short break so stay with us. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Huda TV strives to bring you, our viewers, the best in Islamic programming. Please send your comments and suggestions to feedback at huda.tv. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. And you can write to us, by the way, on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Again, our email address is inspirations at huda.tv. So please do write to us and uh, send your comments, send your suggestions. We'll try to utilize them in the best way possible. Now, the Prophet ﷺ made some kind of modification on the plan because Jibreel came and informed him of the people of Quraysh be willing to destroy the Prophet or to kill the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. So, and as, as I said, there is a narration, there is a story where Shaitan came to them in the form of an old man. Now, the scholars of Hadith have differed regarding this. Some of them consider it to be weak. Some of them consider it to raise up to the level of Hassan and Hassan bi turuqihi But anyway, uh, it's not a big deal, but the issue of the people of Quraysh having a meeting and agreeing that they have to kill the Prophet ﷺ by means of sending those eight or ten young men to kill him, this is established by the narrations, the authentic narrations. But the details that were mentioned are not, have not been uh, you know, agreed upon. So this is why we mentioned them, because they flow anyway, or they go along the authentic narrations, but, and they don't have anything to do with aqidah or with fiqh. So there's no problem mentioning that, but still we say, I personally tend to take the opinion that they are a bit weak. They don't, raise, they don't really rise to the level of being hasan. So the Prophet ﷺ agreed to meet Abu Bakr uh, 
near the well of Maymun. So he went there and Ali ibn Abi Talib remained in his bed, pretending that he was the Prophet So the people of Quraysh, or those young men surrounding the house of the Prophet would be sure that, or be, feel confident that the Prophet was still there at home. So they wanted to be sure that they got hold of him. So they were waiting for him to wake up, then they would jump on him and kill him. So that was the plan for them. But the Messenger وسلم, based on the divine guidance, he realized their plan, so he had already left his house. Now Abu Bakr went and he joined the Prophet وسلم, and then we said the intelligent point was that Medina is to the north of Mecca. But the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr headed south. That was a very intelligent move. Because obviously people would predict that Muhammad وسلم, and Abu Bakr or any of his companions, they would have gone to the north, towards Medina. This is why the Messenger وسلم, made exactly or quite the opposite. He went to the south. He went to the south where he appointed a mountain where there is a cave on top of it. So they went to that mountain, they went to that cave, and they went there. Now on the way to that mountain, Abu Bakr was very confused. He was, very, he was consumed with worry and agitation. Sometimes he would walk ahead of the, in front of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes he would go to the back, sometimes to the right, sometimes to, to the left. So he was worried and he was very nervous. So the Messenger ﷺ said to him, You know, what's wrong with you, Abu Bakr? You know, you're not, you're not feeling well. He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, every time I think about the people of Mecca and that they are chasing you, I, you know, I'm a, I become afraid that they might have put someone in that direction, so I'm afraid that somebody will come from the front. Then I remember that they are chasing us, or they must be after us now. So I go to the back, I'm afraid somebody will come from the back. Then I look to the right, and I'm afraid somebody would come to, from the right, and the same to the left. So I'm worried about that. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Abu Bakr, you're worried about me? He said, yes, O oh, oh Messenger of Allah, I'm worried about you. And I, I will put my life for you. So the Prophet ﷺ was pleased with that, and he uh, assured Abu Bakr and calmed him down. He said, don't worry, Allah is with us. So when they reached the cave, and it was a very intelligent move, Abu Bakr said to the Prophet ﷺ, when he was heading to the cave, he said, hold on. He went inside that small cave and he checked it. He wanted to make sure that there were no you know, uh, that there was nothing there to harm the Prophet ﷺ, like scorpions, snakes, anything. So he went there and he checked and he made sure that the, uh, that the cave was safe. And then he said to the Prophet ﷺ, you can go in. Now we see the love uh, that the companions of the Prophet ﷺ had for him, especially Abu Bakr. This is why he reached a high rank in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why he's, he's the best person in humanity after the Prophets. May the, peace and blessings of, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them. So this is why he reached this high position, Abu Bakr. Now those are all those sites in Mecca and in that cave and in Medina, all of them testify to the love Abu Bakr had for the Prophet ﷺ, to the sacrifice he was willing to offer in order to protect the Messenger ﷺ. They are written there on the stones, on the walls, on the roads, everywhere, in the desert, they are written there. The mountains and the valleys and the desert, they all witness to the love Abu Bakr had to the Prophet ﷺ. So they went in the cave and they were hiding there. Now the people of Quraysh, were waiting, they thought that the Prophet ﷺ was still at home. So when, after they, became, they got fed up, they decided to attack and to break into the house. When they broke into the house, they, fa they found Ali ibn Abi Talib in the bed. It wasn't Muhammad. So they said to him, where is Muhammad? He said, I don't know. I don't know where he is now. Because the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell anyone where he was heading to. No one knew. Apart from one person, we will come to know about him later on, inshaAllah. So they were disappointed and they were enraged, enraged because they thought they, had, they got hold of him. But they discovered that, they, that, they were there, that he had already deceived them. So they went mad. All around Mecca, searching for the Prophet ﷺ, heading north, south, east and west, to the extent that they announced a prize for anyone who, who, who gets 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam who even actually kills him, kills him or brings him here to Mecca. Or Abu Bakr, any one of them. They sent people all around and they said anyone who gets one of them will get a hundred camels. Now a hundred camels is a huge fortune. A hundred camels. So that was enough to tempt all the Arabs to search, the, all the Arabs in that area to search for the Prophet wasallam and Abu Bakr. Now some of the people of Quraysh headed south and they were sat searching around the mountains and they reached the mountain where the Prophet wasallam and Abu Bakr were hiding in. They reached actually that cave and they came to it. To the extent that Abu Bakr says, and the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari from the Musnad, of, from the hadith of Abu Bakr, he says that, I was with the Prophet ﷺ in the cave and I was shivering, I was, I was scared. He said, I said to the Prophet ﷺ, if any of them looks at his feet, if anyone just looks downward, looks at his, at, looks at his feet, he would see us. You know, if they were that close. Imagine, only if one of them just looked at his shoes or, or at his feet, he would see the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr. They were, they were that close. So Abu Bakr was totally scared. And he said to the, to the, actually some of the narrations say that he started weeping. Because he was concerned for the Prophet ﷺ, not for himself, as all the, all the narrations indicate. So the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and this is a lesson that we can take to put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no matter what happens. Once you do what you are supposed to do, once you plan well and execute your plan very well, then put your trust in Allah and there is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. So the Prophet ﷺ turned to Abu Bakr and he said to him, Inna Allah ma'ana. Don't worry ya Abu Bakr. Don't be scared. Don't be worried. Allah is with us. And this word is so powerful. That when you reach the level of Iman, to know that Allah is with you, and you cannot do that while you are sinning. You cannot do that when you are attached to this world. You have to get yourself out of this world. This world can be in your hand, but not in your heart. Then you can reach a level. Obviously not as that level of the Prophet ﷺ, because no one can reach that level of the Prophet ﷺ in terms of Iman. But we can reach a high level of Iman. Then we can know and we, can, we will be able to really believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with us. And once we reach that level of Iman, Allah will really be with us, supporting us and helping us. So the Messenger وسلم, turned to Abu Bakr with being so calm, he said to him, Abu Bakr, Allah is with us. What do you think about two people? What do you think about two people? Allah is with them. What do you think about that? If oh, the whole world was searching for us, it would make no difference. If the whole world was trying to kill us, it will, they will do nothing. And this is the kind of belief that we lack today. We have to admit that. We're always worried about the enemies of Islam having the best, you know, uh, the best warriors, the, best, the, the most sophisticated weapons, the most sophisticated military machines around the world. The greatest armies are the enemies of Islam. We say, what can we do to them? We have to make an army and we have to do... Yes, we have to do that. But we have to build something first. Something in our hearts. Because Allah says, وَمَنْ نَصْرُ إِلَّا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Allah says, indeed, there is no victory except from Allah. Have we come to grips with that fact? Once we reach that level of Iman, then everything material, everything physical will be easy to do. Don't worry about that. Because Allah does not ask you to do something you cannot do. You're only responsible for the things that, that you have control of. You're responsible within the circle of your means. That's it. And within your means is your heart to increase your iman in your heart. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Messenger sallam, with all this calmness, he said to Abu Bakr, Calm down. What do you think about two people? Allah is the third of them. Allah is with them. Obviously, Allah is not with them in Himself, in person. This is not the aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah. The aqeedah of Ahl Sunnah is that Allah with them. This is called the ma'iyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in every situation, 
it is interpreted according to that situation. So in that situation, Allah is with them. With his sight and his hearing, Allah sees them and Allah hears them, and Allah is with them in terms of support, so he's supporting them. This is the meaning of the ma'iyyah in this situation. The scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah say that the ma'iyyah of Allah, that Allah is with his servants, depending on the context, it shows. But it's not in person. Because when we know that Allah rose above the throne in a way that befits his majesty, so Allah is above the heavens. That's it. This is the aqeedah, the correct aqeedah that the Prophet ﷺ had and his companions had. We have no doubt about that. In a way that befits his majesty. So Allah, is not, Allah was not with them in person, but Allah was with them in that context. He was hearing them, he could see them, and he was supporting them. His support was with them, his aid was with them. That is the... Uh, the meaning of the ma'iyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with them. When the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Allah is with us. And we find in Surah At-Tawbah, the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصَرَهُ اللَّهِ إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِيَ اثْنَيْنِ إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْسَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا This word is powerful. Allah says, if you don't help the Prophet and support him, then Allah has supported him. Allah has helped him. إِذْ أَخْرَجَهُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا ثَانِيَ ثَانِ As the disbelievers expelled him, they caused, they caused him to get out of Mecca, to flee Mecca. Along with his companion, meaning Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ When he says to his companion, لَا تَحْزَنْ Don't fear, don't be worried. Allah is with us. You know, how many people among us, do we say that when we fall in trouble? When we are in a very bad situation, when we have fear, when we have worries, when we are concerned about so many things around us, do we see Allah is with us so our hearts feel at rest? This is Iman. Now, this is, these are the situations where Iman really reveals its power, reveals its impact on our hearts. That even at the most critical situations, the most difficult moments in life, when you are facing even a life-threatening situation, you calm. Why? Because Allah is with us. And we remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ because Allah is not with everyone. Allah only supports the people who are obedient to Him, the people who have the belief. And don't forget the thing or the lessons that we learned during Ramadan when we said, when we referred to the hadith of Qudsi, the divine hadith where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ana indadhani abdi bi, I am to my servant as he thinks of me. What do you think of Allah? If you have iman in Allah, strong and uh, you know, solid iman in Allah, then you can reach that level. So the Prophet sallallahu said, Ihfadh Allah, yahfadhk. You know, preserve the commands of Allah. Preserve them, observe them. And Allah will preserve you. You know, observe the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the commands of Allah, you will find the help of Allah wherever you go. You'll find the support of Allah and the care of Allah wherever you go. Then at the end of the hadith he said to him, and be sure that if all of humanity, all of the creatures, all of the creation of Allah, if all of them gather together and you know, decide to harm you with something, they will not be able to harm you, except with something Allah wrote for you. And if they, all of them agree together, and support each other, to give you some kind of benefit, they will not be able to do that, unless Allah wrote that for you already. So if we reach that level of conviction, we will not fear anything. This was the case of the Prophet ﷺ saying to Abu Bakr, لا تحزن إن الله معنا. Don't fear, don't worry. Allah is with us. Allah is with us. This is a very powerful statement. I hope we'll be able to come to grips with it. I really hope that one day we will be able to have such a strong iman that we will be able to put our trust fully in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So the companions came to the uh, to the ghar, to the cave. But none of them looked downward. So they couldn't see the Prophet ﷺ nor his companion Abu Bakr. Then they left. Now, I have to point out that there are some narrations that say that there has been a scorpion, okay? 
and uh, there, are, there have been some pigeons, wild pigeons there. They built a nest for them. So when the, when the people of Quraysh saw those, there, those signs, they said, the, you know, it's impossible for someone to have entered this cave because they would have to, you know, destroy everything here. So this is why uh, they turned away. But we have to mm, point out and make it clear that those narrations talking about these two signs, the scorpion, uh, not the scorpion, sorry, uh, the spider, and the pigeons and the nest, all of those are extremely weak. So we have to point out that. I know that most of us studied that in school, but it's not authentic. So it's by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those people turned away from the cave. Now what happened after this? What other beautiful plans the Prophet ﷺ had already planned? This is something we will find out about inshaAllah after this short break. So stay with us. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Now reaching every corner of the world, watch Huda via live streaming on www.huda.tv. The world of Islam at your fingertips. Huda, a light in every home. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. And you can still write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. As I said, you can send your suggestions and your comments and any inquiries you have, uh, please do write to us. We will be happy to benefit from them. And if you have any questions, we will be, inshallah, we'll do our best to answer them. Now, the Prophet ﷺ being in the cave and the people of Mecca being, you know, very keen to find him. So they sent everybody in every direction in order to get Muhammad ﷺ because they thought they got hold of him, but he managed to escape. So they were extremely enraged and they wanted to get the Prophet ﷺ by any price. So this is why we said they offered a prize for anyone who could get the Prophet ﷺ or Abu Bakr Siddiq a hundred camels or even kill them. Anything. They wanted just to get rid of him by any means possible. So the Prophet ﷺ decided to stay in that cave for three nights. You see the proper planning? He knew that people would start searching for him. And after three days, it means that if he you know, went to Medina, you know, he, would, he would have almost reached Medina. So he left, he stayed those thro three nights in the cave, believing or knowing for sure that after three days, the people would actually have lost hope in catching the Prophet ﷺ or getting hold of him. So that was a very intelligent plan. This is something we have to learn from. We see that the Prophet ﷺ was not somebody, you know, doing doing things haphazardly, just like just like that, on an ad hoc basis, like most of us do. No, he planned very well, very carefully, and very precisely. He knew what he was doing. He knew who he was dealing with, and he could read their thoughts. So we have to learn from this wonderful wisdom. So he knew that. <coughs> In average, a person traveling from Mecca to Medina would take him about three days. So he said that after three days, they would have lost hope, you know, in catching the Prophet ﷺ. This is why he remained about three days in, uh, in that cave. But during that time, you know, they must have needed food. They must have needed to know what was going around them. So those two points did not slip the mind of the, of the Prophet ﷺ. He had already planned or arranged something, made some arrangements in order to solve these two problems. Now before Abu Bakr left, uh, his two daughters, Asma and Aisha, they both prepared some food for him. And, the, and he took with him all his wealth, which was about 5,000 some narrations say that uh, uh, his wealth was 6,000. And that was a lot of wealth at that time. So he took his money and they prepared some food for him in uh, a cloth bag. And uh, then Asma took her waistband, she cut it into two pieces and she 
tied it up with one of those two pieces. This is why she was called that on Nitaqain. Okay, because she cut her waistband into two pieces. So now they took the food and they went to uh, they had already taken it with uh, taken the food with them to the cave. But the food was not enough for them for three days and obviously because they had to to be light. They didn't want to carry much weight with them because they needed to go quickly. Uh, another thing, you know, the father of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, was called Abu Quhafa. He was an old man and the narration suggests that he was blind. He wasn't a Muslim at that time. He was still on disbelief. He came to the house of Abu Bakr after Abu Bakr had left and he came and he found his two daughters and he said, you know, I know that my son, okay, left you without any wealth, without any food, without anything. He was actually, you know, in some way criticizing Abu Bakr. He wasn't pleased with that. But Asma said to him, no, a grandpa, he left for us so much money and he left us everything we need. Then she went to the uh, small cabinet or small, uh, you know, hole where they used to keep their money and she put some pieces of cloth, uh, she put some stones, small pebbles and some pieces of cloth on top. Because money at that time was made of gold, you know, big pieces of gold and, or big coins of gold and silver. So she said, because he was blind, she brought her grandfather. She said to him, come touch here, you see? He put his hand, she said, this is money, he left his money for us. He said, okay, if, he, if this is what he did, that, that's fine. We see that those two little girls were, you know, were cultivated to make Islam their main concern. They were actually older in terms of intelligence than their real age. So anyway, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was in the cave along with Abu Bakr. Now we said there are two issues here now. They wanted to know the news of everything that was going around them. They had to get some news. And the other thing, they needed some food. So the Prophet ﷺ had already prepared for that. In terms of news, there is the son of Abu Bakr, Abdullah, was a very intelligent young man. They had already agreed with him that he spends the whole day in Mecca, mixing with the people of Mecca as normal. Knowing what plans they had, knowing everything they wanted to do, then after sunset he would go, he would sneak to go to the cave, join Abu Bakr and the Prophet ﷺ and tell them everything there and he would sleep there, spend the night there. And then before dawn, in the morning, he would leave the cave and go to Mecca as if he spent the night in Mecca, normally, as if he slept at his house. So that was the plan to get the news. But they wanted food. How could they want, uh, get food? There were, the Prophet ﷺ anticipated that if Abdullah would bring the news and the food, people might you know, follow him or, or uh, surveil him or follow him and they might he might then guide them to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ, there was a shepherd that used to work for Abu Bakr. You know this shepherd, Amr ibn Fuhaira, uh, he used to tend the sheep all day long in the desert. Then during the night, he would go to the cave. So that would erase the marks or the footsteps of Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr. And normally shepherds, you know, spend their time in the open area just to try to find some... Uh, to graze their sheep. So there was nothing uh, that would create any some kind of suspicion or doubts. So he would go to them at night and they would milk the sheep and he would give them some food and then before dawn he would leave. So that was a very intelligent plan on the part of the Prophet ﷺ where they remained for uh, three nights in that cave. So we see now that the Prophet ﷺ planned everything perfectly. And this is something we have to learn from. That calculate everything perfectly. Don't say that Allah will make it easy. You know, don't ha you don't have to plan for that. Or there's a gap in the plan. There's, you know, uh, something really wrong with the plan. We say, you know, don't worry, Allah will make it easy. This is an attitude that is very common among us today. And this is something we have to, we have to do away with. Because this is not tawakkul, this is tawakkul. The Prophet ﷺ says that Allah loves that when one of you does a piece of work or you do anything that you do it perfectly. That you do your best to do it perfectly. And this is how the Prophet ﷺ planned for the Hijrah and this is how he performed it. And we are supposed to follow his example. So this kind of attitude, okay, leave it. I know Allah will make it go. Allah will make it work. 
No, this is the wrong attitude, and this is not in accordance with the teachings of Islam. So we have to be sure about that. Now, after three days, the Prophet, the Prophet وسلم, was you know, determined to set out on his journey to Medina. Now, how did he plan all of this? There was a wonderful plan as well for that. You know, don't think, you know, when you see the planning of the Prophet وسلم, there is no gap. There is no, you know, uh, generally, or by the human standards, there is no uh, escape, or there is no hole, there is no gap in that plan. It's planned perfectly. And then if anything goes wrong, you know, if anything gets out of control, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we put our trust in Him, Allah will make it up for us. So this is the attitude that we should have. Inshallah, when you join us next time, we will see how the Prophet وسلم, planned to, to go to Medina. Because they needed riding animals. How did the Prophet وسلم, prepare for that? All of this, inshallah, we'll try to put it in perspective and we will try to reveal the wisdoms that we find in it when you join us next time to talk about the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now until then, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us sincerity and forgiveness and to help us follow the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but he knows there must be rain. We always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer. But our hearts will lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. So whenever we feel that everything's going wrong, it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. And the merriment of cheer, but our hearts will lose their tenderness. If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirit